Chapter Four of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Four. Once on a time, no matter when, some Glenemies met in a glen as deft and tight as ever wore a dirk a targe and a claymore short hose and belted plaid or trews in oost lockaber sky or loose or covered hard head with his bonnet had you but known them you would own it meston a hill was now before the travellers covered with an ancient forest of scottish firs the topmost of which flinging their scathed branches across the western horizon gleamed ruddy in the setting sun in the centre of this wood rose the towers or rather the chimneys of the house or castle as it was called destined for the end of their journey as usual at that period one or two high-ridged narrow buildings intersecting and crossing each other formed the corps de loges a protecting bartizan or two with the addition of small turrets at the angles much resembling pepper-boxes had procured for darnlinvarach the dignified appellation of a castle it was surrounded by a low courtyard wall within which were the usual offices as the travellers approached more nearly they discovered marks of recent additions to the defences of the place which had been suggested doubtless by the insecurity of those troublesome times additional loopholes for musketry were struck out in different parts of the building and of its surrounding wall the windows had just been carefully secured by stanchions of iron crossing each other athwart and and long like the grates of a prison the door of the courtyard was shut and it was only after cautious challenge that one of its leaves was opened by two domestics both strong highlanders and both under arms like bidius and ponderous in the aenid ready to defend the entrance if aught hostile had ventured an intrusion when the travellers were admitted into the court they found additional preparations for defence the walls were scaffolded for the use of firearms and one or two of the small guns called sackers or falcons were mounted at the angles and flanking turrets more domestics both in the highland and lowland dress instantly rushed from the anterior of the mansion and some hastened to take the horses of the strangers while others waited to marshal them away into the dwelling-house but captain dalgetty refused the proffered assistance of those who wished to relieve him of the charge of his horse it is my custom my friends to see gustavus or so i have called him after my invincible master accommodated myself we are old friends and fellow-travellers and as i often need the use of his legs i always lend him in my turn the service of my tongue to call for whatever he has occasion for and accordingly he strode into the stable after his steed without farther apology neither lord menteith nor his attendants paid the same attention to their horses but leaving them to the proffered care of the servants of the place walked forward into the house where a sort of dark vaulted vestibule displayed among other miscellaneous articles a huge barrel of twopenny ale beside which were ranged two or three wooden quiches or bickers ready it would appear for the service of whoever thought proper to employ them lord menteith applied himself to the spigot drank without ceremony and then handed the stoop to anderson who followed his master's example but not until he had flung out the drop of ale which remained and slightly rinsed the wooden cup what the deal man said an old highland servant belonging to the family can she no drink after her ain master without washing the cup and spilling the ale and be tamed to her i was bred in france answered anderson where nobody drinks after another 
out of the same cup unless it be after a young lady the teal's in their nicety said donald and if the ale be good fat the wear isn't that another man's beard ben in the quiche before ye anderson's companion drank without observing the ceremony which had given donald so much offence and both of them followed their master into the low arched stone hall which was the common rendezvous of a highland family a large fire of peats in the huge chimney at the upper end shed a dim light throughout the apartment and was rendered necessary by the damp by which even during the summer the apartment was rendered uncomfortable twenty or thirty targets as many claymores with dirks and plaids and guns both matchlock and firelock and longbows and crossbows and lockaber axes and coats of plate armour and steel bonnets and headpieces and the more ancient haborgians or shirts of reticulated mail with hood and sleeves corresponding to it all hung in confusion about the walls and would have formed a month's amusement to a member of a modern antiquarian society but such things were too familiar to attract much observation on the part of the present spectators there was a large clumsy oaken table which the hasty hospitality of the domestic who had before spoken immediately spread with milk butter goat milk cheese a flagon of beer and a flask of uskbay designed for the refreshment of lord menteith while an inferior servant made similar preparations at the bottom of the table for the benefit of his attendants the space which intervened between them was according to the manners of the times sufficient distinction between master and servant even though the former was as in the present instance of high rank meanwhile the guests stood by the fire the young nobleman under the chimney and his servants at some little distance what do you think anderson said the former of our fellow-traveller a stout fellow replied anderson if all be good that is up come i wish we had twenty such to put our teagues into some sort of discipline i differ from you anderson said lord menteith i think this fellow dalgetty is one of those horse-leeches whose appetite for blood being only sharpened by what he has sucked in foreign countries he is now returned to batten upon that of his own shame on the pack of these mercenary swordsmen they have made the name of scott through all europe equivalent to that of a pitiful mercenary who knows neither honour nor principle but his month's pay who transfers his allegiance from standard to standard at the pleasure of fortune or the highest bidder and to whose insatiable thirst for plunder and warm quarters we owe so much of that civil dissension which is now turning our swords against our own bowels i had scarce patience with the hired gladiator and yet could hardly help laughing at the extremity of his impudence your lordship will forgive me said anderson if i recommend to you in the present circumstances to conceal at least a part of this generous indignation we cannot unfortunately do our work without the assistance of those who act on baser motives than our own we cannot spare the assistance of such fellows as our friend the soldado to use the canting phrase of the saints in the english parliament the sons of zeruiah are still too many for us i must dissemble then as well as i can said lord menteith as i have hitherto done upon your hint but i wish the fellow at the devil with all my heart ay but still you must remember my lord resumed anderson that to cure the bite of a scorpion you must crush another scorpion on the wound but stop we shall be overheard from a side door in the hall glided a highlander into the apartment whose lofty stature and complete equipment as well as the eagle's feather in his bonnet and the confidence of his demeanour announced to be a person of superior rank he walked slowly up to the table and made no answer to lord menteith 
who addressing him by the name of allan asked him how he did ye manna speak to her even now whispered the old attendant the tall highlander sinking down upon the empty settle next the fire fixed his eyes upon the red embers and the huge heap of turf and seemed buried in profound abstraction his dark eyes and wild and enthusiastic features bore the air of one who deeply impressed with his own subjects of meditation pays little attention to exterior objects an air of gloomy severity the fruit perhaps of ascetic and solitary habits might in a lowlander have been ascribed to religious fanaticism but by that disease of the mind then so common both in england and the lowlands of scotland the highlanders of this period were rarely infected they had however their own peculiar superstitions which overclouded the mind with thick coming fancies as completely as the puritanism of their neighbours his lordship's honour said the highland servant sidling up to lord menteith and speaking in a very low tone his lordship manna speak to allan even now for the cloud is upon his mind lord menteith nodded and took no farther notice of the reserved mountaineer said i not asked the latter suddenly raising his stately person upright and looking at the domestic said i not that four were to come and here stand but three on the hall floor in troth did ye say so allan said the old highlander and here's the fourth man coming clinking in at the yet even now from the stable for he's shelled like a parton with arn on back and breast haunch and shanks and am i to set her chair up near the menteith's or down with the honest gentleman at the foot of the table lord menteith himself answered the inquiry by pointing to a seat beside his own and here she comes said donald as captain dalgetty entered the hall and i hope gentlemen's will all take bread and cheese as we say in the glens until better meat be ready until the ternach comes back from the hill with the southern gentlefolk and then dugald cook will show himself with his kid and hill venison in the meantime captain dalgetty had entered the apartment and walking up to the seat placed next lord menteith was leaning on the back of it with his arms folded anderson and his companion waited at the bottom of the table in a respectful attitude until they should receive permission to seat themselves while three or four highlanders under the direction of old donald ran hither and thither to bring additional articles of food or stood still to give attendance upon the guests in the midst of these preparations allan suddenly started up and snatching a lamp from the hand of an attendant held it close to dalgetty's face while he perused his features with the most heedful and grave attention by my honour said dalgetty half displeased as mysteriously shaking his head allan gave up the scrutiny i trow that lad and i will ken each other when we meet again meanwhile allan strode to the bottom of the table and having by the aid of his lamp subjected anderson and his companion to the same investigation stood a moment as if in deep reflection then touching his forehead suddenly seized anderson by the arm and before he could offer any effectual resistance half led and half dragged him to the vacant seat at the upper end and having made a mute intimation that he should there place himself he hurried the soldado with the same unceremonious precipitation to the bottom of the table the captain exceedingly incensed at this freedom endeavoured to shake allan from him with violence but powerful as he was he proved in the struggle inferior to the gigantic mountaineer who threw him off with such violence that after reeling a few paces he fell at full length and the vaulted hall rang with the clash of his armour when he arose his first action was to draw his sword and to fly at allan who with folded arms seemed to await his onset with the most scornful indifference lord menteith and his attendants interposed 
to preserve peace while the highlanders snatching weapons from the wall seemed prompt to increase the broil he is mad whispered lord menteith he is perfectly mad there is no purpose in quarrelling with him if your lordship is assured that he is non compos mentis said captain dalgetty the whilk his breeding and behaviour seem to testify the matter must end here seeing that a madman can neither give an affront nor render honourable satisfaction but by my soul if i had my province and a bottle of rhenish under my belt i should have stood otherwise up to him and yet it's a pity he should be so weak in the intellectuals being a strong proper man of body fit to handle pike morgenstern or any other military implement whatsoever this was a sort of club or mace used in the earlier part of the seventeenth century in the defence of breaches and walls when the germans insulted a scotch regiment then besieged in trailsend saying they heard there was a ship come from denmark to them laden with tobacco pipes one of our soldiers says colonel robert munro showing them over the work of a morgenstern made of a large stock banded with iron like the shaft of a halberd with a round globe at the end with cross iron pikes saith here is one of the tobacco pipes wherewith we will beat out your brains when you intend to storm us peace was thus restored and the party seated themselves agreeably to their former arrangement with which allan who had now returned to his settle by the fire and seemed once more immersed in meditation did not again interfere lord menteith addressing the principal domestic hastened to start some theme of conversation which might obliterate all recollection of the fray that had taken place the laird is at the hill then donald i understand and some english strangers with him at the hill he is and it like your honour and two saxon caliballeros are with him sure enough and that is sir miles musgrave and christopher hall both from the cumrack as i think they call their country hall and musgrave said lord menteith looking at his attendants the very men that we wish to see troth said donald and i wish i had never seen them between the inn for they're come to harry us out a house and hum why donald said lord menteith you did not use to be so churlish of your beef and ale southland though they be they'll scarce eat up all the cattle that's going on the castle mains till care and they did said donald and that were the worst of it for we had a ween canny truesman here that wouldna let us want if there was a horned beast atween this and perth but this was a warse job it's nay less than a wager a wager repeated lord menteith with some surprise troth continued donald to the full as eager to tell his news as lord menteith was curious to hear them as your lordship is a friend and kinsman of the house and as ye'll hear enough of it in less than an hour i may as well tell ye myself ye shall be pleased then to know that when our lord was up in england where he gangs oftener than his friends can wish he was bidding at the house of this sir miles musgrave and there was a puttin on the table six candlesticks and they tell me were twice as muckle as the candlesticks in dunblane kirk and neither iron brass nor tin but a solid silver no less up with their english pride has so muckle and ken so little how to guide it say they begin to jeer the lord and he saw nigh sick graith in his and poor country and the laird scorning to have his country put down without a word for its credit swore like a good scotsman that he had mare candlesticks and better candlesticks in his ain castle at home than were ever lighted in a hall in cumberland and cumberland be the name of the country that was patriotically said observed lord menteith very true said donald but her honour had better have hardened her tongue for if ye say only one thing among the saxons that's a wee by ordinaire 
they clink ye down for a wager as fast as a lowland smith could hammer shoon on a highland shelty and so the laird behooved either to give back his word or wager to hundred merks and say he even took the wager rather than be shamed with the like of them and now he's like to get it to pay and i'm thinking that's what makes him so swear to come home at even indeed said lord menteith from my idea of your family plate donald your master is certain to lose such a wager your honour may swear that and where he's to get the siller i kenna although he borrowed out o twenty purses i advised him to pit the twa saxon gentlemen and their servants cannily into the pit of the tower till they gave up the bargain of free good will but the laird winna hear reason allan here started up strode forward and interrupted the conversation saying to the domestic in a voice like thunder and how dared you to give my brother such dishonourable advice or how dare you to say he will lose this or any other wager which it is his pleasure to lay troth allan macaulay answered the old man it's no for my father's son to gainsay what your father's son thinks fit to say e'en so the laird may no doubt win his wager and that i ken against it is that the tail a candlestick or only one like it is in the house except the old arn branches that has been here since lord kenneth's time and the tin sconces that your father guard be made by old willie winkie the tinkler mare be broken that deal and unce of siller plate is about the house at a forby the lady's old posset dish that wants the cover and ane of the lugs peace old man said allan fiercely and do you gentlemen if your reflection is finished leave this apartment clear i must prepare it for the reception of these southern guests come away said the domestic pulling lord menteith by the sleeve his hour is on him said he looking towards allan and he will not be controlled they left the hall accordingly lord menteith and the captain being ushered one way by old donald and the two attendants conducted elsewhere by another highlander the former had scarcely reached a sort of withdrawing apartment ere they were joined by the lord of the mansion angus macaulay by name and his english guests great joy was expressed by all parties for lord menteith and the english gentlemen were well known to each other and on lord menteith's introduction captain dalgetty was well received by the laird but after the first burst of hospitable congratulation was over lord menteith could observe that there was a shade of sadness on the brow of his highland friend you must have heard said sir christopher hall that our fine undertaking in cumberland is all blown up the militia would not march into scotland and your prick-eared covenanters have been too hard for our friends in the southern shires and so understanding there is some stirring work here musgrave and i rather than sit idle at home are come to have a campaign among your kilts and plaids i hope you have brought arms men and money with you said lord menteith smiling only some dozen or two of troopers whom we left at the last lowland village said musgrave and trouble enough we had to get them so far as for money said his companion we expect a small supply from our friend and host here the laird now colouring highly took menteith a little apart and expressed to him his regret that he had fallen into a foolish blunder i heard it from donald said lord menteith scarce able to suppress a smile devil take that old man said macaulay he would tell everything were it to cost one's life but it's no jesting matter to you neither my lord for i reckon on your friendly and fraternal benevolence as a near kinsman of our house to help me out with the money due to these pock puddings or else to be plain with ye the deal a macaulay will there be at the muster for curse me if i do not turn covenanter rather than face these fellows without paying them 
and at the best i shall be ill enough off getting both the scathe and the scorn you may suppose cousin said lord menteith i am not too well equipped just now but you may be assured i shall endeavour to help you as well as i can for the sake of old kindred neighbourhood and alliance thank ye thank ye thank ye reiterated macaulay and as they are to spend the money in the king's service what signifies whether you they or i pay it we are all one man's barns i hope but you must help me out too with some reasonable excuse or else i shall be for taking to andrew ferrara for i like not to be treated like a liar or a braggart at my own board end when god knows i only meant to support my honour and that of my family and country donald as they were speaking entered with rather a blither face than he might have been expected to wear considering the impending fate of his master's purse and credit gentlemen's her dinner is ready and her candles are lighted too said donald with a strong guttural emphasis on the last clause of his speech what the devil can he mean said musgrave looking to his countryman lord menteith put the same question with his eyes to the laird which macaulay answered by shaking his head a short dispute about precedence somewhat delayed their leaving the apartment lord menteith insisted upon yielding up that which belonged to his rank on consideration of his being in his own country and of his near connection with the family in which they found themselves the two english strangers therefore were first ushered into the hall where an unexpected display awaited them the large oaken table was spread with substantial joints of meat and seats were placed in order for the guests behind every seat stood a gigantic highlander completely dressed and armed after the fashion of his country holding in his right hand his drawn sword with the point turned downwards and in the left a blazing torch made of the bog pine this wood found in the morasses is so full of turpentine that when split and dried it is frequently used in the highlands instead of candles the unexpected and somewhat startling apparition was seen by the red glare of the torches which displayed the wild features unusual dress and glittering arms of those who bore them while the smoke eddying up to the roof of the hall over canopied them with a volume of vapour ere the strangers had recovered from their surprise allan stepped forward and pointing with his sheathed broadsword to the torch-bearers said in a deep and stern tone of voice behold gentlemen cavaliers the chandeliers of my brother's house the ancient fashion of our ancient name not one of these men knows any law but their chief's command would you dare to compare to them in value the richest ore that ever was dug out of the mine how say you cavaliers is your wager won or lost 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 said musgrave gaily my own silver candlesticks are all melted and riding on horseback by this time and i wish the fellows that enlisted were half as trusty as these here sir he added to the chief is your money it impairs hull's finances and mine somewhat but debts of honour must be settled my father's curse upon my father's son said allan interrupting him if he receive from you one penny it is enough that you claim no right to exact from him what is his own lord menteith eagerly supported allan's opinion and the elder macaulay readily joined declaring the whole to be a fool's business and not worth speaking more about the englishmen after some courteous opposition were persuaded to regard the whole as a joke and now allan said the laird please to remove your candles for since the saxon gentlemen have seen them they will eat their dinner as comfortably by the light of the old tin sconces without scomfishing them with so much smoke accordingly at a sign from allan the living chandeliers recovering their broadswords and holding the point erect marched out of the hall and left the guests to enjoy their refreshment such a bet 
as that mentioned in the text is said to have been taken by macdonald of keppoch who extricated himself in the manner there narrated End of chapter four chapter five of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 5. Thereby so fearless and so fell he grew, that his own sire and master of his guise did often tremble at his horrid view, and if for dread of hurt would him advise, the angry beast not rashly to despise, nor too much to provoke for he would learn the lion stoop to him in lowly wise a lesson hard and make the libbard stern leave roaring when in rage he for revenge did earn spencer notwithstanding the proverbial epicurism of the english proverbial that is to say in scotland at the period the english visitors made no figure whatever at the entertainment compared with the portentous veracity of captain dalgetty although that gallant soldier had already displayed much steadiness and pertinacity in his attack upon the lighter refreshment set before them at their entrance by way of forlorn hope he spoke to no one during the time of his meal and it was not until the victuals were nearly withdrawn from the table that he gratified the rest of the company who had watched him with some surprise with an account of the reasons why he ate so very fast and so very long the former quality he said he had acquired while he filled a place at the bursar's table at the marshall college of aberdeen when said he if you did not move your jaws as fast as a pair of castanets you were very unlikely to get anything to put between them and as for the quantity of my food be it known to this honourable company continued the captain that it's the duty of every commander of a fortress on all occasions which offer to secure as much munition and vivers as their magazines can possibly hold not knowing when they may have to sustain a siege or a blockade upon which principle gentlemen said he when a cavalier finds that provant is good and abundant he will in my estimation do wisely to victual himself for at least three days as there is no knowing when he may come by another meal the laird expressed his acquiescence in the prudence of this principle and recommended to the veteran to add a tass of brandy and a flagon of claret to the substantial provisions he had already laid in to which proposal the captain readily agreed when dinner was removed and the servants had withdrawn excepting the laird's page or henchman who remained in the apartment to call for or bring whatever was wanted or in a word to answer the purposes of a modern bell-wire the conversation began to turn upon politics and the state of the country and lord menteith inquired anxiously and particularly what clans were expected to join the proposed muster of the king's friends that depends much my lord on the person who lifts the banner said the laird for you know we highlanders when a few clans are assembled are not easily commanded by one of our own chiefs or to say the truth by any other buddy we have heard a rumour indeed that colkitto that is young colkitto or alister macdonald is come over the kyle from ireland with a body of the earl of antrim's people and that they had got as far as ardnamurchan they might have been here before now but i suppose they loitered to plunder the country as they came along will colkitto not serve you for a leader then said lord menteith colkitto said allan m'aulay scornfully who talks of colkitto there lives but one man whom we will follow and that is montrose 
but montrose sir said sir christopher hall has not been heard of since our ineffectual attempt to rise in the north of england it is thought he has returned to the king at oxford for farther instructions returned said allan with a scornful laugh i could tell ye but it is not worth my while ye will know soon enough by my honour allan said lord menteith you will weary out your friends with this intolerable froward and sullen humour but i know the reason added he laughing you have not seen annot lyle to-day whom did you say i had not seen said allan sternly annot lyle the fairy queen of song and minstrelsy said lord menteith would to god i were never to see her again said allan sighing on condition the same weird were laid on you and why on me said lord menteith carelessly because said allan it is written on your forehead that you are to be the ruin of each other so saying he rose up and left the room has he been long in this way asked lord menteith addressing his brother about three days answered angus the fit is well-nigh over and he will be better to-morrow but come gentlemen don't let the tappen hen scraw to be emptied the king's health king charles's health and may the covenanting dog that refuses it go to heaven by the road of the grass market the health was quickly pledged and as fast succeeded by another and another and another all of a party cast and enforced in an earnest manner captain dalgetty however thought it necessary to enter a protest gentlemen cavaliers he said i drink these healths primo both out of respect to this honourable and hospitable roof-tree and secundo because i hold it not good to be precise in such matters inter pocula but i protest agreeable to the warren dice granted by this honourable lord that it shall be free to me notwithstanding my present complaisance to take service with the covenanters to-morrow providing i shall be so minded macaulay and his english guests stared at this declaration which would have certainly bred new disturbance if lord menteith had not taken up the affair and explained the circumstances and conditions i trust he concluded we shall be able to secure captain dalgetty's assistance to our own party and if not said the laird i protest as the captain says that nothing that has passed this evening not even his having eaten my bread and salt and pledged me in brandy bordeaux or uskba shall prejudice my cleaving him to the neck-bone you shall be heartily welcome said the captain providing my sword cannot keep my head which it has done in worse dangers than your fend is likely to make for me here lord menteith again interposed and the concord of the company being with no small difficulty restored was cemented by some deep carouses lord menteith however contrived to break up the party earlier than was the usage of the castle under pretence of fatigue and indisposition this was somewhat to the disappointment of the valiant captain who among other habits acquired in the low countries had acquired both a disposition to drink and a capacity to bear an exorbitant quantity of strong liquors their landlord ushered them in person to a sort of sleeping gallery in which there was a four-post bed with tartan curtains and a number of cribs or long hampers placed along the wall three of which well stuffed with blooming heather were prepared for the reception of guests i need not tell your lordship said macaulay to lord menteith a little apart our highland mode of quartering only that not liking you should sleep in the room alone with this german landlauper i have caused your servants beds to be made here in the gallery by god my lord these are times when men go to bed with a throat hail and sound as ever swallowed brandy and before next morning it may be gaping like an oyster-shell lord menteith thanked him sincerely saying 
it was just the arrangement he would have requested for although he had not the least apprehension of violence from captain dalgetty yet anderson was a better kind of person a sort of gentleman whom he always liked to have near his person i have not seen this anderson said macaulay did you hire him in england i did so said lord menteith you will see the man to-morrow in the meantime i wish you good-night his host left the apartment after the evening salutation and was about to pay the same compliment to captain dalgetty but observing him deeply engaged in the discussion of a huge pitcher filled with brandy posset he thought it a pity to disturb him in so laudable an employment and took his leave without farther ceremony lord menteith's two attendants entered the apartment almost immediately after his departure the good captain who was now somewhat encumbered with his good cheer began to find the undoing of the clasps of his armour a task somewhat difficult and addressed anderson in these words interrupted by a slight hiccup anderson my good friend you may read in scripture that he that putteth off his armour should not boast himself like he that putteth it on i believe that is not the right word of command but the plain truth of it is i am like to sleep in my corslet like many an honest fellow that never waked again unless you unloose this buckle undo his armour sibald said anderson to the other servant by st andrew exclaimed the captain turning round in great astonishment here's a common fellow a stipendiary with four pounds a year and a livery cloak thinks himself too good to serve ritmaster dugald dalgetty of drumthwacket who has studied humanity at the marischal college of aberdeen and served half the princes of europe captain dalgetty said lord menteith whose lot it was to stand peacemaker throughout the evening please to understand that anderson waits upon no one but myself and i will help sibald to undo your corslet with much pleasure too much trouble for you my lord said dalgetty and yet it would do you no harm to practise how a handsome harness is put on and put off i can step in and out of mine like a glove only to-night although not ebrius i am in the classic phrase vino sibok gravitus by this time he was unshelled and stood before the fire musing with a face of drunken wisdom on the events of the evening what seemed chiefly to interest him was the character of allan macaulay to come over the englishman so cleverly with his highland torch-bearers eight bare-breeched rories for six silver candlesticks it was a masterpiece a tour de passe it was perfect ledger domain and to be a madman after all i doubt greatly my lord shaking his head that i must allow him notwithstanding his relationship to your lordship the privileges of a rational person and either betune him sufficiently to expiate the violence offered to my person or else bring it to a matter of mortal arbitrament as becometh an insulted cavalier if you care to hear a long story said lord menteith at this time of night i can tell you how the circumstances of allan's birth account so well for his singular character as to put such satisfaction entirely out of the question a long story my lord said captain dalgetty is next to a good evening draught and a warm nightcap the best shoeing horn for drawing on a sound sleep and since your lordship is pleased to take the trouble to tell it i shall rest your patient and obliged auditor anderson said lord menteith and you sibald are dying to hear i suppose of this strange man too and i believe i must indulge your curiosity that you may know how to behave to him in time of need you had better step to the fire then having thus assembled an audience about him lord menteith sat down upon the edge of the four-post bed while captain dalgetty wiping the relics of the posset from his beard and moustachios and repeating the first verse of the lutheran psalm 
al guter geister loben der herrn etc rolled himself into one of the places of repose and thrusting his shock pate from between the blankets listened to lord menteith's relation in a most luxurious state between sleeping and waking the father said lord menteith of the two brothers angus and allan macaulay was a gentleman of consideration and family being the chief of a highland clan of good account though not numerous his lady the mother of these young men was a gentlewoman of good family if i may be permitted to say so of one nearly connected with my own her brother an honourable and spirited young man obtained from james the sixth a grant of forestry and other privileges over a royal chase adjacent to this castle and in exercising and defending these rights he was so unfortunate as to involve himself in a quarrel with some of our highland freebooters or caterans of whom i think captain dalgetty you must have heard and that i have said the captain exerting himself to answer the appeal before i left the marischal college of aberdeen dugald gar was playing the devil in the garioc and the farcarsons on d side and the clan chatton on the gordon's lands and the grants and camerons in moray land and since that i have seen the cravats and pandors in pannonia and transylvania and the cossacks from the polish frontier and robbers banditti and barbarians of all countries besides so that i have a distinct idea of your broken highlandmen the clan said lord menteith with whom the maternal uncle of the macaulays had been placed in feud was a small sept of banditti called from their houseless state and their incessantly wandering among the mountains and glens the children of the mist they are a fierce and hardy people with all the irritability and wild and vengeful passions proper to men who have never known the restraint of civilized society a party of them lay in wait for the unfortunate warden of the forest surprising him while hunting alone and unattended and slew him with every circumstance of inventive cruelty they cut off his head and resolved in a bravado to exhibit it at the castle of his brother-in-law the laird was absent and the lady reluctantly received as guests men against whom perhaps she was afraid to shut her gates refreshments were placed before the children of the mist who took an opportunity to take the head of their victim from the plaid in which it was wrapped placed it on the table put a piece of bread between the lifeless jaws bidding them to do their office now since many a good meal they had eaten at that table the lady who had been absent for some household purpose entered at this moment and upon beholding her brother's head fled like an arrow out of the house into the woods uttering shriek upon shriek the ruffians satisfied with this savage triumph withdrew the terrified menials after overcoming the alarm to which they had been subjected sought their unfortunate mistress in every direction but she was nowhere to be found the miserable husband returned next day and with the assistance of his people undertook a more anxious and distant search but to equally little purpose it was believed universally that in the ecstasy of her terror she must either have thrown herself over one of the numerous precipices which overhang the river or into a deep lake about a mile from the castle her loss was the more lamented as she was six months advanced in her pregnancy angus macaulay her oldest son having been born about eighteen months before but i tire you captain dalgetty and you seem inclined to sleep by no means answered the soldier i am no whit somnolent i always hear best with my eyes shut it is a fashion i learned when i stood sentinel and i dare say said lord menteith aside to anderson the weight of the halberd of the sergeant of the rounds often made him open them being apparently however in the humour of story-telling the young nobleman went on addressing himself chiefly to his servants 
without minding the slumbering veteran every baron in the country said he now swore revenge for this dreadful crime they took arms with the relations and brother-in-law of the murdered person and the children of the mist were hunted down i believe with as little mercy as they had themselves manifested seventeen heads the bloody trophies of their vengeance were distributed among the allies and fed the crows upon the gates of their castles the survivors sought out more distant wildernesses to which they retreated to your right hand countermarch and retreat to your former ground said captain dalgetty the military phrase having produced the correspondent word of command and then starting up professed he had been profoundly attentive to every word that had been spoken it is the custom in summer said lord menteith without attending to his apology to send the cows to the upland pastures to have the benefit of the grass and the maids of the village and of the family go there to milk them in the morning and evening while thus employed the females of this family to their great terror perceived that their motions were watched at a distance by a pale thin meagre figure bearing a strong resemblance to their deceased mistress and passing of course for her apparition when some of the boldest resolved to approach this faded form it fled from them into the woods with a wild shriek the husband informed of this circumstance came up to the glen with some attendants and took his measures so well as to intercept the retreat of the unhappy fugitive and to secure the person of his unfortunate lady though her intellect proved to be totally deranged how she supported herself during her wandering in the woods could not be known some supposed she lived upon roots and wild berries with which the woods at that season abounded but the greater part of the vulgar were satisfied that she must have subsisted upon the milk of the wild does or been nourished by the fairies or supported in some manner equally marvellous her reappearance was more easily accounted for she had seen from the thicket the milking of the cows to superintend which had been her favourite domestic employment and the habit had prevailed even in her deranged state of mind in due season the unfortunate lady was delivered of a boy who not only showed no appearance of having suffered from his mother's calamities but appeared to be an infant of uncommon health and strength the unhappy mother after her confinement recovered her reason at least in a great measure but never her health and spirits allan was her only joy her attention to him was unremitting and unquestionably she must have impressed upon his early mind many of those superstitious ideas to which his moody and enthusiastic temper gave so ready a reception she died when he was about ten years old her last words were spoken to him in private but there is little doubt that they conveyed an injunction of vengeance upon the children of the mist with which he has since amply complied from this moment the habits of allan macaulay were totally changed he had hitherto been his mother's constant companion listening to her dreams and repeating his own and feeding his imagination which probably from the circumstances preceding his birth was constitutionally deranged with all the wild and terrible superstitions so common to the mountaineers to which his unfortunate mother had become much addicted since her brother's death by living in this manner the boy had gotten a timid wild startled look loved to seek out solitary places in the woods and was never so much terrified as by the approach of children of the same age i remember although some years younger being brought up here by my father upon a visit nor can i forget the astonishment with which i saw this infant hermit shun every attempt i made to engage him in the sports natural to our age i can remember his father bewailing his disposition to mine and alleging at the same time that it was impossible for him to take from his wife 
the company of the boy as he seemed to be the only consolation that remained to her in this world and as the amusement which allan's society afforded her seemed to prevent the recurrence at least in its full force of that fearful malady by which she had been visited but after the death of his mother the habits and manners of the boy seemed at once to change it is true he remained as thoughtful and serious as before and long fits of silence and abstraction showed plainly that his disposition in this respect was in no degree altered but at other times he sought out the rendezvous of the youth of the clan which he had hitherto seemed anxious to avoid he took share in all their exercises and from his very extraordinary personal strength soon excelled his brother and other youths whose age considerably exceeded his own they who had hitherto held him in contempt now feared if they did not love him and instead of allan's being esteemed a dreaming womanish and feeble-minded boy those who encountered him in sports or military exercise now complained that when heated by the strife he was too apt to turn game into earnest and to forget that he was only engaged in a friendly trial of strength but i speak to regardless ears said lord menteith interrupting himself for the captain's nose now gave the most indisputable signs that he was fast locked in the arms of oblivion if you mean the ears of that snorting swine my lord said anderson they are indeed shut to anything that you can say nevertheless this place being unfit for more private conference i hope you will have the goodness to proceed for sibald's benefit and for mine the history of this poor young fellow has a deep and wild interest in it you must know then proceeded lord menteith that allan continued to increase in strength and activity till his fifteenth year about which time he assumed a total independence of character and impatience of control which much alarmed his surviving parent he was absent in the woods for whole days and nights under pretence of hunting though he did not always bring home game his father was the more alarmed because several of the children of the mist encouraged by the increasing troubles of the state had ventured back to their old haunts nor did he think it altogether safe to renew any attack upon them the risk of allan in his wanderings sustaining injury from these vindictive freebooters was a perpetual source of apprehension i was myself upon a visit to the castle when this matter was brought to a crisis allan had been absent since daybreak in the woods where i had sought for him in vain it was a dark stormy night and he did not return his father expressed the utmost anxiety and spoke of detaching a party at the dawn of morning in quest of him when as we were sitting at the supper-table the door suddenly opened and allan entered the room with a proud firm and confident air his intractability of temper as well as the unsettled state of his mind had such an influence over his father that he suppressed all other tokens of displeasure excepting the observation that i had killed a fat buck and had returned before sunset while he supposed allan who had been on the hill till midnight had returned with empty hands are you sure of that said allan fiercely here is something will tell you another tale we now observed his hands were bloody and that there were spots of blood on his face and waited the issue with impatience when suddenly undoing the corner of his plaid he rolled down on the table a human head bloody and new severed saying at the same time lie thou where the head of a better man lay before ye from the haggard features and matted red hair and beard partly grizzled with age his father and others present recognized the head of hector of the mist a well-known leader among the outlaws redoubted for strength and ferocity who had been active in the murder of the unfortunate forester uncle to allan 
and had escaped by a desperate defence and extraordinary agility when so many of his companions were destroyed we were all it may be believed struck with surprise but allan refused to gratify our curiosity and we only conjectured that he must have overcome the outlaw after a desperate struggle because we discovered that he had sustained several wounds from the contest all measures were now taken to ensure him against the vengeance of the freebooters but neither his wounds nor the positive command of his father nor even the locking of the gates of the castle and the doors of his apartment were precautions adequate to prevent allan from seeking out the very persons to whom he was peculiarly obnoxious he made his escape by night from the window of the apartment and laughing at his father's vain care produced on one occasion the head of one and upon another those of two of the children of the mist at length these men fierce as they were became appalled by the inveterate animosity and audacity with which allan sought out their recesses as he never hesitated to encounter any odds they concluded that he must bear a charmed life or fight under the guardianship of some supernatural influence neither gun dirk nor dorlac dorlac quiver literally satchel of arrows they said availed aught against him they imputed this to the remarkable circumstances under which he was born and at length five or six of the stoutest caterans of the highlands would have fled at allan's halloo or the blast of his horn in the meanwhile however the children of the mist carried on their old trade and did the macaulays as well as their kinsmen and allies as much mischief as they could this provoked another expedition against the tribe in which i had my share we surprised them effectually by besetting at once the upper and under passes of the country and made such clean work as is usual on these occasions burning and slaying right before us in this terrible species of war even the females and the helpless do not always escape one little maiden alone who smiled upon allan's drawn dirt escaped his vengeance upon my earnest entreaty she was brought to the castle and here bred up under the name of anna lyle the most beautiful little fairy certainly that ever danced upon a heath by moonlight it was long ere allan could endure the presence of the child until it occurred to his imagination from her features perhaps that she did not belong to the hated blood of his enemies but had become their captive in some of their incursions a circumstance not in itself impossible but in which he believes as firmly as in holy writ he is particularly delighted by her skill in music which is so exquisite that she far exceeds the best performers in this country in playing on the clairsac or harp it was discovered that this produced upon the disturbed spirits of allan in his gloomiest moods beneficial effects similar to those experienced by the jewish monarch of old and so engaging is the temper of annat lyle so fascinating the innocence and gaiety of her disposition that she is considered and treated in the castle rather as the sister of the proprietor than as a dependent upon his charity indeed it is impossible for any one to see her without being deeply interested by the ingenuity liveliness and sweetness of her disposition take care my lord said anderson smiling there is danger in such violent commendations allan macaulay as your lordship describes him would prove no very safe rival pooh pooh said lord menteith laughing yet blushing at the same time allan is not accessible to the passion of love and for myself said he more gravely annet's unknown birth is a sufficient reason against serious designs and her unprotected state precludes every other it is spoken like yourself my lord said anderson but i trust you will proceed with your interesting story it is well-nigh finished said lord menteith i have only to add 
that from the great strength and courage of allan macaulay from his energetic and uncontrollable disposition and from an opinion generally entertained and encouraged by himself that he holds communion with supernatural beings and can predict future events the clan pay a much greater degree of deference to him than even to his brother who is a bold-hearted rattling highlander but with nothing which can possibly rival the extraordinary character of his younger brother such a character said anderson cannot but have the deepest effect on the minds of a highland host we must secure allan my lord at all events what between his bravery and his second sight hush said lord menteith that owl is awaking do you talk of the second sight or deuterocopia said the soldier i remember memorable major munro telling me how murdoch mackenzie born in assent a private gentleman in a company and a pretty soldier foretold the death of donald tough a lockaber man and certain other persons as well as the hurt of the major himself at a sudden onfall at the siege of trailsend i have often heard of this faculty observed anderson but i have always thought those pretending to it were either enthusiasts or impostors i should be loath said lord menteith to apply either character to my kinsman allan macaulay he has shown on many occasions too much acuteness and sense of which you this night had an instance for the character of an enthusiast and his high sense of honour and manliness of disposition free him from the charge of imposture your lordship then said anderson is a believer in his supernatural attributes by no means said the young nobleman i think that he persuades himself that the predictions which are in reality the result of judgment and reflection are supernatural impressions on his mind just as fanatics conceive the workings of their own imagination to be divine inspiration at least if this will not serve you anderson i have no better explanation to give and it is time we were all asleep after the toilsome journey of the day End of chapter five chapter six of a legend of montrose by sir walter scott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter six coming events cast their shadows before campbell at an early hour in the morning the guests of the castle sprung from their repose and after a moment's private conversation with his attendants lord menteith addressed the soldier who was seated in a corner burnishing his corslet with rotstone and chamois leather while he hummed the old song in honour of the victorious gustavus adolphus when cannons are roaring the bullets are flying the lad that would have honour boys must never fear dying captain dalgetty said lord menteith the time is come that we must part or become comrades in service not before breakfast i hope said captain dalgetty i should have thought replied his lordship that your garrison was victualled for three days at least i have still some stowage left for beef and bannocks said the captain and i never miss a favourable opportunity of renewing my supplies but said lord menteith no judicious commander allows either flags of truce or neutrals to remain in his camp longer than is prudent and therefore we must know your mind exactly according to which you shall either have a safe conduct to depart in peace or be welcome to remain with us truly said the captain that being the case i will not attempt to protract the capitulation by a counterfeited parley a thing excellently practised by sir james ramsay at the siege of hanno 
in the year of god sixteen thirty six but i will frankly own that if i like your pay as well as your provent and your company i care not how soon i take the oath to your colours our pay said lord menteith must at present be small since it is paid out of the common stock raised by the few amongst us who can command some funds as major and adjutant i dare not promise captain dalgetty more than half a dollar a day the devil take all halves and quarters said the captain were it in my opinion i could no more consent to the halving of that dollar than the woman in the judgment of solomon to the disseverment of the child of her bowels the parallel will scarce hold captain dalgetty for i think you would rather consent to the dividing of the dollar than give it up entire to your competitor however in the way of arrears i may promise you the other half dollar at the end of the campaign ah these arrearages said captain dalgetty that are always promised and always go for nothing spain austria and sweden all sing one song oh long life to the hogan mogans if they were no officers of soldiers they were good paymasters and yet my lord if i could but be made certiorate that my natural hereditament of drumthwacket had fallen into possession of any of these loons of covenanters who could be in the event of our success conveniently made a traitor of i have so much value for that fertile and pleasant spot that i would even take on with you for the campaign i can resolve captain dalgetty's question said sibald lord menteith's second attendant for if his estate of drumthwacket be as i conceive the long waste moor so called that lies five miles south of aberdeen i can tell him it was lately purchased by elias strachan as rank a rebel as ever swore the covenant the crop-eared hound said captain dalgetty in a rage what the devil gave him the assurance to purchase the inheritance of a family of four hundred years standing cynthius arum valet as we used to say at marischal college that is to say i will pull him out of my father's house by the ears and so my lord menteith i am yours hand and sword body and soul till death do us part or to the end of the next campaign whichever event shall first come to pass and i said the young nobleman rivet the bargain with a month's pay in advance that is more than necessary said dalgetty pocketing the money however but now i must go down look after my war saddle and and abulsaments and see that gustavus has his morning and tell him we have taken new service there goes your precious recruit said lord menteith to anderson as the captain left the room i fear we shall have little credit of him he is a man of the times however said anderson and without such we should hardly be able to carry on our enterprise let us go down answered lord menteith and see how our muster is likely to thrive for i hear a good deal of bustle in the castle when they entered the hall the domestics keeping modestly in the background morning greetings passed between lord menteith angus macaulay and his english guests while allan occupying the same settle which he had filled the preceding evening paid no attention whatever to any one old donald hastily rushed into the apartment a message from vike alister moore the patronymic of macdonnell of glengarry he is coming up in the evening with how many attendants said macaulay some five and twenty or thirty said donald his ordinary retinue shake down plenty of straw in the great barn said the laird another servant here stumbled hastily in announcing the expected approach of sir hector Maline, who is arriving with a large following 
put them in the malt kiln said macaulay and keep the breadth of the middenstead between them and the macdonalds they are but unfriends to each other donald now re-entered his visage considerably lengthened the tells i the folk he said the hale highlands are austere i think evan dhu of lochiel will be here in an hour with lord ken's no how many gillies into the great barn with them beside the macdonalds said the laird more and more chiefs were announced the least of whom would have accounted it derogatory to his dignity to stir without a retinue of six or seven persons to every new annunciation angus macaulay answered by naming some place of accommodation the stables the loft the cowhouse the sheds every domestic office were destined for the night to some hospitable purpose or other at length the arrival of macdougall of lorne after all his means of accommodation were exhausted reduced him to some perplexity what the devil is to be done donald said he the great barn would hold fifty more if they would lie heads and thralls but there would be drawn dirks among them which should lie uppermost and so we should have bloody puddings before morning what needs all this said allan starting up and coming toward with a stern abruptness of his usual manner are the gael to-day of softer flesh or whiter blood than their fathers were knock the head out of a cask of Uskbay. let that be their night-gear their plaids their bedclothes the blue sky their canopy and the heather their couch come a thousand more and they would not quarrel on the broad heath for want of room allan is right said his brother it is very odd how allan who between ourselves said he to musgrave is a little woof woof that is crazed seems at times to have more sense than us all put together observe him now yes continued allan fixing his eyes with a ghastly stare upon the opposite side of the hall they may well begin as they are to end many a man will sleep this night upon the heath that when the martinmas wind shall blow shall lie there stark enough and reck little of cold or lack of covering do not forespeak us brother said angus that is not lucky and what luck is it then that you expect said allan and straining his eyes until they almost started from their sockets he fell with a convulsive shudder into the arms of donald and his brother who knowing the nature of his fits had come near to prevent his fall they seated him upon a bench and supported him until he came to himself and was about to speak for god's sake allan said his brother who knew the impression his mystical words were likely to make on many of the guests say nothing to discourage us am i he who discourages you said allan let every man face his world as i shall face mine that which must come will come and we shall stride gallantly over many a field of victory ere we reach yon fatal slaughter-place or tread yon sable scaffolds what slaughter-place what scaffolds exclaimed several voices for allan's renown as a seer was generally established in the highlands you will know that but too soon answered allan speak to me no more i am weary of your questions he then pressed his hand against his brow rested his elbow upon his knee and sunk into a deep reverie send for annet lyle and the harp said angus in a whisper to his servant and let those gentlemen follow me who do not fear a highland breakfast all accompanied their hospitable landlord excepting only lord menteith who lingered in one of the deep embrasures formed by the windows of the hall annet lyle shortly after glided into the room not ill described by lord menteith as being the lightest and most fairy figure that ever trod the turf by moonlight her stature considerably less than the ordinary size of women gave her the appearance of extreme youth insomuch 
that although she was near eighteen she might have passed for four years younger her figure hands and feet were formed upon a model of exquisite symmetry with the size and lightness of her person so that titania herself could scarcely have found a more fitting representative her hair was a dark shade of the colour usually termed flaxen whose clustering ringlets suited admirably with her fair complexion and with the playful yet simple expression of her features when we add to these charms that annet in her orphan state seemed the gayest and happiest of maidens the reader must allow us to claim for her the interest of almost all who looked on her in fact it was impossible to find a more universal favourite and she often came among the rude inhabitants of the castle as allan himself in a poetical mood expressed it like a sunbeam on a sullen sea communicating to all others the cheerfulness that filled her own mind annet such as we have described her smiled and blushed when on entering the apartment lord menteith came from his place of retirement and kindly wished her good morning and good morning to you my lord returned she extending her hand to her friend we have seldom seen you of late at the castle and now i fear it is with no peaceful purpose at least let me not interrupt your harmony annet said lord menteith though my arrival may breed discord elsewhere my cousin allan needs the assistance of your voice and music my preserver said annet lyle has a right to my poor exertions and you too my lord you too are my preserver and were the most active to save a life that is worthless enough unless it can benefit my protectors so saying she sat down at a little distance upon the bench on which allan macaulay was placed and tuning her clairshach a small harp about thirty inches in height she accompanied it with her voice the air was an ancient gaelic melody and the words which were supposed to be very old were in the same language but we subjoin a translation of them by secundus macpherson esq of glenforgan which although submitted to the fetters of english rhythm we trust will be found nearly as genuine as the version of ossian by his celebrated namesake birds of omen dark and foul night crow raven bat and owl leave the sick man to his dream all night long he heard your scream haste to cave and ruined tower ivy tod or dingle bower there to wink and mope for hark in the mid-air sings the lark hie to moorish gills and rocks prowling wolf and wily fox hie you fast nor turn your view though the lamb bleats to the ewe couch your trains and speed your flight safety parts with parting night and on distant echo borne comes the hunter's early horn the moon's wan crescent scarcely gleams ghost-like she fades in morning beams high hence each peevish imp and fay that scare the pilgrim on his way quench kelpie quench in bog and fen thy torch that cheats benighted men thy dance is over thy reign is done for beniglo hath seen the sun wild thoughts that sinful dark and deep overpower the passive mind in sleep pass from the slumberer's soul away like night mists from the brow of day foul hag whose blasted visage grim smothers the pulse unnerves the limb spur thy dark palfrey and be gone thou darest not face the godlike sun as the strain proceeded allan macaulay gradually gave signs of recovering his presence of mind and attention to the objects around him the deep knit furrows of his brow relaxed and smoothed themselves and the rest of his features which had seemed contorted with internal agony relapsed into a more natural state when he raised his head and sat upright his countenance though still deeply melancholy was divested of its wildness and ferocity 
and in its composed state although by no means handsome the expression of his features was striking manly and even noble his thick brown eyebrows which had hitherto been drawn close together were now slightly separated as in the natural state and his grey eyes which had rolled and flashed from under them with an unnatural and portentous gleam now recovered a steady and determined expression thank god he said after sitting silent for about a minute until the very last sounds of the harp had ceased to vibrate my soul is no longer darkened the mist hath passed from my spirit you owe thanks cousin allan said lord menteith coming forward to annet lyle as well as to heaven for this happy change in your melancholy mood my noble cousin menteith said allan rising and greeting him very respectfully as well as kindly has known my unhappy circumstances so long that his goodness will require no excuse for my being thus late in bidding him welcome to the castle we are two old acquaintances allan said lord menteith and two good friends to stand on the ceremonial of outward greeting but half the highlands will be here to-day and you know with our mountain chiefs ceremony must not be neglected what will you give little annot for making you fit company to meet evan dhu and i know not how many bonnets and feathers what will he give me said annot smiling nothing less i hope than the best ribbon at the fair of down the fair of down annot said allan sadly there will be bloody work before that day and i may never see it but you have well reminded me of what i have long intended to do having said this he left the room should he talk long in this manner said lord menteith you must keep your harp in tune my dear annet i hope not said annet anxiously this fit has been a long one and probably will not soon return it is fearful to see a mind naturally generous and affectionate afflicted by this constitutional malady as she spoke in a low and confidential tone lord menteith naturally drew close and stooped forward that he might the better catch the sense of what she said when allan suddenly entered the apartment they as naturally drew back from each other with a manner expressive of consciousness as if surprised in a conversation which they wished to keep secret from him this did not escape allan's observation he stopped short at the door of the apartment his brows were contracted his eyes rolled but it was only the paroxysm of a moment he passed his broad sinewy hand across his brow as if to obliterate those signs of emotion and advanced towards annet holding in his hand a very small box made of oak wood curiously inlaid i take you to witness he said cousin menteith that i give this box and its contents to annet lyle it contains a few ornaments that belong to my poor mother of trifling value you may guess for the wife of a highland laird has seldom a rich jewel casket but these ornaments said annet lyle gently and timidly refusing the box belong to the family i cannot accept they belong to me alone annet said allan interrupting her they were my mother's dying bequest they are all i can call my own except my plaid and my claymore take them therefore they are to me valueless trinkets and keep them for my sake should i never return from these wars so saying he opened the case and presented it to annet if said he they are of any value dispose of them for your own support when this house has been consumed with hostile fire and can no longer afford your protection but keep one ring in memory of allan who has done to requite your kindness if not all he wished at least all he could annet lyle endeavoured in vain to restrain the gathering tears when she said one ring allan i will accept from you as a memorial of your goodness to a poor orphan but do not press me to take more for i cannot and will not accept a gift of such disproportioned value 
make your choice then said allan your delicacy may be well founded the others will assume a shape in which they may be more useful to you think not of it said annot choosing from the contents of the casket a ring apparently the most trifling in value which it contained keep them for your own or your brother's bride but good heavens she said interrupting herself and looking at the ring what is this that i have chosen allan hastened to look upon it with eyes of gloomy apprehension it bore in enamel a death's head above two crossed daggers when allan recognized the device he uttered a sigh so deep that she dropped the ring from her hand which rolled upon the floor lord menteith picked it up and returned it to the terrified annet i take god to witness said allan in a solemn tone that your hand young lord and not mine has again delivered to her this ill-omened gift it was the mourning ring worn by my mother in memorial of her murdered brother i fear no omens said annet smiling through her tears and nothing coming through the hands of my two patrons so she was wont to call lord menteith and allan can bring bad luck to the poor orphan she put the ring on her finger and turning to her harp sung to a lively air the following verses of one of the fashionable songs of the period which had found its way marked as it was with the quaint hyperbolical taste of king charles's time from some court mask to the wilds of perthshire gaze not upon the stars fond sage in them no influence lies to read the fate of youth or age look on my helen's eyes yet rash astrologer refrain too dearly would be won the prescience of another's pain if purchased by thine own she is right allan said lord menteith and this end of an old song is worth all we shall gain by our attempt to look into futurity she is wrong my lord said allan sternly though you who treat with lightness the warnings i have given you may not live to see the event of the omen laugh not so scornfully he added interrupting himself or rather laugh on as loud and as long as you will your term of laughter will find a pause ere long i care not for your visions allan said lord menteith however short my span of life the eye of no highland seer can see its termination for heaven's sake said annot lyle interrupting him you know his nature and how little he can endure fear me not said allan interrupting her my mind is now constant and calm but for you young lord said he turning to lord menteith my eye has sought you through fields of battle where highlanders and lowlanders lay strewed as thick as ever the rooks sat on those ancient trees pointing to a rookery which was seen from the window my eyes sought you but your corpse was not there my eyes sought you among a train of unresisting and disarmed captives drawn up within the bounding walls of an ancient and rugged fortress flash after flash platoon after platoon the hostile shot fell amongst them they dropped like the dry leaves in autumn but you were not among their ranks scaffolds were prepared blocks were arranged sawdust was spread the priest was ready with his book the headsman with his axe but there too mine eyes found you not the gibbet then i suppose must be my doom said lord menteith yet i wish they had spared me the halter were it but for the dignity of the peerage he spoke this scornfully yet not without a sort of curiosity and a wish to receive an answer for the desire of prying into futurity frequently has some influence even on the minds of those who disavow all belief in the possibility of such predictions your rank my lord will suffer no dishonour in your person or by the manner of your death three times have i seen a highlander plant his dirk in your bosom and such will be your fate i wish you would describe him to me said lord menteith 
and i shall save him the trouble of fulfilling your prophecy if his plaid be passable to sword or pistol your weapons said allan would avail you little nor can i give you the information you desire the face of the vision has been ever averted from me so be it then said lord menteith and let it rest in the uncertainty in which your augury has placed it i shall dine not the less merrily among plaids and dirks and kilts to-day it may be so said allan and it may be you do well to enjoy these moments which to me are poisoned by auguries of future evil but i he continued i repeat to you that this weapon that is such a weapon as this touching the hilt of the dirk which he wore carries your fate in the meanwhile said lord menteith you allan have frightened the blood from the cheeks of annot lyle let us leave this discourse my friend and go to see what we both understand the progress of our military preparations they joined angus macaulay and his english guests and in the military discussions which immediately took place allan showed a clearness of mind strength of judgment and a precision of thought totally inconsistent with the mystical light in which his character has been hitherto exhibited End of chapter six chapter seven of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter seven when albin her claymore indignantly draws when her bonneted chieftains around her shall crowd clan ronald the dauntless and moray the proud all plaided and plumed in their tartan array lochiel's warning whoever saw that morning the castle of darnlivarock beheld a busy and a gallant sight the various chiefs arriving with their different retinues which notwithstanding their numbers formed no more than their usual equipage and bodyguard upon occasions of solemnity saluted the lord of the castle and each other with overflowing kindness or with haughty and distant politeness according to the circumstances of friendship or hostility in which their clans had recently stood to each other each chief however small his comparative importance showed the full disposition to exact from the rest the deference due to a separate and independent prince while the stronger and more powerful divided among themselves by recent contentions or ancient feuds were constrained in policy to use great deference to the feelings of their less powerful brethren in order in case of need to attach as many well-wishers as might be to their own interest and standard thus the meeting of chiefs resembled not a little those ancient diets of the empire where the smallest fragraf who possessed a castle perched upon a barren crag with a few hundred acres around it claimed the state and honours of a sovereign prince and a seat according to his rank among the dignitaries of the empire the followers of the different leaders were separately arranged and accommodated as room and circumstances best permitted each retaining however his henchmen who waited close as the shadow upon his person to execute whatever might be required by his patron the exterior of the castle afforded a singular scene the highlanders from different islands glens and straths eyed each other at a distance with looks of emulation inquisitive curiosity or hostile malevolence but the most astounding part of the assembly at least to a lowland ear was the rival performance of the bagpipers these warlike minstrels who had the highest opinion each of the superiority of his own tribe joined to the most overweening idea of the importance connected with his profession at first performed their various pibrochs in front each of his own clan 
at length however as the black cocks towards the end of the season when in sportsman's language they are said to flock or crowd attracted together by the sound of each other's triumphant crow even so did the pipers swelling their plaids and tartans in the same triumphant manner in which the birds ruffle up their feathers begin to approach each other within such distance as might give to their brethren a sample of their skill walking within a short interval and eyeing each other with looks in which self-importance and defiance might be traced they strutted puffed and plied their screaming instruments each playing his own favourite tune with such a din that if an italian musician had lain buried within ten miles of them he must have risen from the dead to run out of hearing the chieftains meanwhile had assembled in close conclave in the great hall of the castle among them were the persons of the greatest consequence in the highlands some of them attracted by zeal for the royal cause and many by aversion to that severe and general domination which the marquis of argyle since his rising to such influence in the state had exercised over his highland neighbours that statesman indeed though possessed of considerable abilities and great power had failings which rendered him unpopular among the highland chiefs the devotion which he professed was of a morose and fanatical character his ambition appeared to be insatiable and inferior chiefs complained of his want of bounty and liberality add to this that although a highlander and of a family distinguished for valour before and since gillespie grumach ill-favoured which from an obliquity in his eyes was the personal distinction he bore in the highlands where titles of rank are unknown was suspected of being a better man in the cabinet than in the field he and his tribe were particularly obnoxious to the macdonalds and the macleans two numerous septs who though disunited by ancient feuds agreed in an intense dislike to the campbells or as they were called the children of diarmid for some time the assembled chiefs remained silent until some one should open the business of the meeting at length one of the most powerful of them commenced the diet by saying we have been summoned hither macaulay to consult of weighty matters concerning the king's affairs and those of the state and we crave to know by whom they are to be explained to us macaulay whose strength did not lie in oratory intimated his wish that lord menteith should open the business of the council with great modesty and at the same time with spirit that young lord said he wished what he was about to propose had come from some person of better known and more established character since however it lay with him to be spokesman he had to state to the chiefs assembled that those who wished to throw off the base yoke which fanaticism had endeavoured to wreath round their necks had not a moment to lose the covenanters he said after having twice made war upon their sovereign and having extorted from him every request reasonable or unreasonable which they thought proper to demand after their chiefs had been loaded with dignities and favours after having publicly declared when his majesty after a gracious visit to the land of his nativity was upon his return to england that he returned a contented king from a contented people after all this and without even the pretext for a national grievance the same men have upon doubts and suspicions equally dishonourable to the king and groundless in themselves detached a strong army to assist his rebels in england in a quarrel with which scotland had no more to do than she has with the wars in germany it was well he said that the eagerness with which this treasonable purpose was pursued had blinded the junta who now usurped the government of scotland to the risk which they were about to incur the army which they had dispatched to england under old levin comprehended their veteran soldiers the strength of those armies which had been levied in scotland during the two former wars 
here captain dalgetty endeavoured to rise for the purpose of explaining how many veteran officers trained in the german wars were to his certain knowledge in the army of the earl of leven but alan macaulay holding him down in his seat with one hand pressed the forefinger of the other upon his own lips and though with some difficulty prevented his interference captain dalgetty looked upon him with a very scornful and indignant air by which the other's gravity was in no way moved and lord menteith proceeded without farther interruption the moment he said was most favourable for all true-hearted and loyal scotsmen to show that the reproach their country had lately undergone arose from the selfish ambition of a few turbulent and seditious men joined to the absurd fanaticism which disseminated from five hundred pulpits had spread like a land flood over the lowlands of scotland he had letters from the marquis of huntley in the north which he should show to the chiefs separately that nobleman equally loyal and powerful was determined to exert his utmost energy in the common cause and the powerful earl of seaforth was prepared to join the same standard from the earl of Airlie and the ogilvies in angusher he had had communications equally decided and there was no doubt that these who with the hayes leiths burnets and other loyal gentlemen would be soon on horseback would form a body far more than sufficient to overawe the northern covenanters who had already experienced their valour in the well-known rout which was popularly termed the trot of turriff south of forth and tay he said the king had many friends who oppressed by enforced oaths compulsory levies heavy taxes unjustly imposed and unequally levied by the tyranny of the committee of estates and the inquisitorial insolence of the presbyterian divines waited but the waving of the royal banner to take up arms douglas traquair roxburgh hume all friendly to the royal cause would counterbalance he said the covenanting interest in the south and two gentlemen of name and quality here present from the north of england would answer for the zeal of cumberland westmoreland and northumberland against so many gallant gentlemen the southern covenanters could but arm raw levies the Wigamores of the western shires and the ploughmen and mechanics of the low country for the west highlands he knew no interest which the covenanters possessed there except of one individual as well known as he was odious but there was a single man who on casting his eye round this hall and recognizing the power the gallantry and the dignity of the chiefs assembled could entertain a moment's doubt of their success against the utmost force which gillespie grumach could collect against them he had only farther to add that considerable funds both of money and ammunition had been provided for the army here dalgetty picked up his ears that officers of ability and experience in the foreign wars one of whom was now present the captain drew himself up and looked round had engaged to train such levies as might require to be disciplined and that a numerous body of auxiliary forces from ireland having been detached from the earl of antrim from ulster had successfully accomplished their descent upon the main land and with the assistance of clan Ranald's people having taken and fortified the castle of mingory in spite of argyle's attempts to intercept them were in full march to this place of rendezvous it only remained he said that the noble chiefs assembled laying aside every lesser consideration should unite heart and hand in the common cause send the fiery cross through their clans in order to collect their utmost force and form their junction with such celerity as to leave the enemy no time either for preparation or recovery from the panic which would spread at the first sound of their pibroch he himself he said though neither among the richest nor the most powerful of the scottish nobility felt that he had to support the dignity of an ancient and honourable house 
the independence of an ancient and honourable nation and to that cause he was determined to devote both life and fortune if those who were more powerful were equally prompt he trusted they would deserve the thanks of their king and the gratitude of posterity loud applause followed this speech of lord menteith and testified the general acquiescence of all present in the sentiments which he had expressed but when the shout had died away the assembled chiefs continued to gaze upon each other as if something yet remained to be settled after some whispers among themselves an aged man whom his grey hairs rendered respectable although he was not of the highest order of chiefs replied to what had been said thane of menteith he said you have well spoken nor is there one of us in whose bosom the same sentiments do not burn like fire but it is not strength alone that wins the fight it is the head of the commander as well as the arm of the soldier that brings victory i ask of you who is to raise and sustain the banner under which we are invited to rise and muster ourselves will it be expected that we should risk our children and the flower of our kinsmen ere we know to whose guidance they are to be entrusted this were leading those to slaughter whom by the laws of god and man it is our duty to protect where is the royal commission under which the lieges are to be convocated in arms simple and rude as we may be deemed we know something of the established rules of war as well as the laws of our country nor will we arm ourselves against the general peace of scotland unless by the express commands of the king and under a leader fit to command such men as are here assembled where would you find such a leader said another chief starting up saving the representative of the lord of the isles entitled by birth and hereditary descent to lead forth the array of every clan of the highlands and where is that dignity lodged save in the house of vic alister more i acknowledge said another chief eagerly interrupting the speaker the truth in what has been first said but not the inference if vic alister more desires to be held representative of the lord of the isles let him first show his blood is redder than mine that is soon tried said vic alister more laying his hand upon the basket hilt of his claymore lord menteith threw himself between them entreating and imploring each to remember that the interests of scotland the liberty of their country and the cause of their king ought to be superior in their eyes to any personal disputes respecting descent rank and precedence several of the highland chiefs who had no desire to admit the claims of either chieftain interfered to the same purpose and none with more emphasis than the celebrated evan dhu i have come from my lakes he said as a stream descends from the hills not to turn again but to accomplish my course it is not by looking back to our own pretensions that we shall serve scotland or king charles my voice shall be for that general whom the king shall name who will doubtless possess those qualities which are necessary to command men like us high-born he must be or we shall lose our rank in obeying him wise and skilful or we shall endanger the safety of our people bravest among the brave or we shall peril our own honour temperate firm and manly to keep us united such is the man that must command us are you prepared thane of menteith to say where such a general is to be found there is but one said allan m'aulay and here he said laying his hand upon the shoulder of anderson who stood behind lord menteith here he stands the general surprise of the meeting was expressed by an impatient murmur when anderson throwing back the cloak in which his face was muffled and stepping forward spoke thus i did not long intend to be a silent spectator of this interesting scene although my hasty friend has obliged me to disclose myself somewhat sooner than was my intention whether i deserve the honour reposed in me by this parchment 
will best appear from what i shall be able to do for the king's service it is a commission under the great seal to james graham earl of montrose to command those forces which are to be assembled for the service of his majesty in this kingdom a loud shout of approbation burst from the assembly there was in fact no other person to whom in point of rank these proud mountaineers would have been disposed to submit his inveterate and hereditary hostility to the marquis of argyle ensured his engaging in the war with sufficient energy while his well-known military talents and his tried valour afforded every hope of his bringing it to a favourable conclusion. End of chapter 7